You'll have to excuse my nasally voice this morning. I'm recovering from a cold. Beginning of the school year, you know? Everybody seems to get sick at the beginning of the school year. So I want to add a scripture reading to our list this morning. This comes from Luke chapter 24, and it's the narrative of Easter Sunday about the empty tomb, and it focuses on the women. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles, that the tomb was empty. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Please join me in prayer. Open our eyes that we might see wondrous things in your word. Amen. In an August piece in the New York Times Magazine, Kwame Apia, a philosophy professor at NYU, gives a brief history of the word condescending. Condescending used to be a good thing, he writes. Back in the 18th and 19th centuries, it referred to an act of generosity and basic kindness, as when a person of one status treated a person of another status as though they were peers. Samuel Johnson's 1755 dictionary defined the word condescension as voluntary submission to equality. Writer Fanny Burney in 1778 said that condescension is a distinguishing virtue of the moral life, a sign of one's kindness. Jane Austen, in her 1813 novel Pride and Prejudice, connected affability with condescension. And in the 1830s, John Payne Collier, a librarian for the Duke of Devonshire, recalls in his diary that the Duke invited him to lunch in his palatial dining room and went to great lengths to, in Collier's words, lessen the distance between us and to put me at ease on a level with himself. I call it kindness, he wrote. Today in our more democratic age, writes Apia, we don't dare admit that we think we're better than others, let alone that other, ed, others might be better than us. The first article of our Constitution declares, no title of nobility shall be granted by the United States. But something like that old meaning of condescension remains a common practice, he says. We simply lost the name for it. When the president of a university stops to speak to a student after a lecture, she is talking down a hierarchy of academic status, and the student is likely to be charmed. Just as an Episcopal priest is gratified by the considerate attentions of a bishop, and the security guard is pleased when the down-to-earth museum trustee remembers her name. If we want a culture with a greater regard for the dignity of all, he concludes, the way to get it may involve being kind in this way. In today's Gospel reading from Mark, Jesus teaches his disciples about what we might call good condescension. Although I must admit, even after reading Apia's article, the word condescension still sounds like nails on a chalkboard to me. And so I'm not going to use it again in this sermon. <clears throat> After telling the disciples again that his way would lead to a cross, and after he's just told the disciples, as we heard in last week's reading from Mark, that following him means taking up a cross, the disciples are confused. And, writes Mark, they didn't ask for clarification. Jesus has taught them about self-sacrifice and service, taking up a cross, but in the very next scene, we find the disciples arguing with each other over which of them was the greatest. It's one of those tightly wound tales, like so many in the Gospels, that provide just enough detail to keep the story moving apace, but also one where we might wish to pause and be a fly on the wall to hear them argue. We also might want to jump into the scene ourselves blow a whistle to stop the fight, and tell the disciples they're all wrong about who's the greatest. Muhammad Ali was the greatest. <laughs> Jesus blows the whistle himself to stop the fight, gathers up a little child, and says, if you want to be first, you must be last and servant of all. And then he says, whoever welcomes someone like this child welcomes me 
and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. It's a lesson in treating all people as peers, regardless of place in life, as Kwame Apia writes, or as Fanny Burney and Jane Austen and the librarian John Payne Collier recognized, it's showing kindness that lessens the distance between people and puts everyone on a level plane. By holding a child to make this point, Jesus is being especially provocative, as they still are today. Children in antiquity were the most vulnerable members of society, the last in line, to modify the words of Jesus. A person's greatness, he says, is not measured in the markers of success or in positions of power or in accumulated wealth or in letters after one's name or in the connections a person might have to the people who matter. Greatness is measured in how society treats its most vulnerable. Jesus adds a bit of theology to hammer home this point. By welcoming society's children, we welcome him. And by welcoming him, we welcome God. Or to put that differently, we see God in the faces of the most vulnerable, those who feel the least safe. I was reminded of these words of Jesus when I came across a story recently about a man who was shaving on a commuter train leaving New York City. The man, Anthony Torres, was mocked online after he was recorded shaving at his seat while riding on the train. A fellow passenger recorded Torres sitting in his seat, steadily wiping away at his lathered face and tossing the shaving cream from the razor onto the floor. Welcome to New Jersey Transit, read the video's caption. The self-grooming earned its share of negative comments on the internet with insults like slob, animal, and nasty. Others humorously lauded his steady hand with the razor. A few cautioned against passing judgment and suggested people didn't know the whole story. The truth, Torres said, is that the video captured him at a vulnerable moment. He'd been homeless and staying in a shelter in New York City. He'd reached out to his family for help. A brother gave him money for a train ticket, which he was using to get to another brother in southern New Jersey. He said he left the shelter before he had a chance to shower and clean up and wanted to look presentable. I don't want to say that I am homeless and let everybody know, he said. That's why I was shaving. Torres said he worked a number of different jobs in his life, including casino security guard and then construction. He moved to wherever the work was, like Florida, where his oldest son lives. He said he spent time living in motels or sleeping in bus depots. Medical conditions have also been a problem for him. He suffered two strokes in the past two years. When he arrived at his brother's house, he felt unworthy to sleep inside. And so he asked for a sleeping bag, saying he was prepared to go and spend a night under the bridge. When he found out he'd been filmed on the train, he said he was amazed and a little upset. I never thought it would go viral. People making fun of me, he said. His brother Thomas said they reached out to the media because he thought it was important for people to hear his brother's story. Maybe people will have more feeling knowing what this guy's been through, he said. If he were around today, I could imagine Jesus embracing Anthony Torres while saying the exact same thing he said to his disciples so long ago. Whoever welcomes one such person in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. And I could imagine Jesus teaching that greatness is measured in the compassion one shows to this person who shaves on a train to look presentable. And if Jesus were around today, I could imagine him saying to our many Catholic brothers and sisters who've been stricken with horror over the clergy abuse in Pennsylvania and elsewhere, that greatness is not measured in clerical office or preservation of an institution, but in how the church's children are treated. And if Jesus were around today, I don't think it's a stretch to imagine him saying that greatness is measured not in immigration policies that isolate children, but in policies that protect them. And if Jesus were around today, I could imagine him teaching that greatness is measured not in personal arsenals, 
but in how we protect children in schools and on city streets from gun violence. And if Jesus were around today, I could imagine him teaching his modern disciples about greatness by pointing out after this week's news that greatness is not measured in prestigious degrees or elitist pedigrees or successful careers or in the powerful positions of U.S. senators, but greatness is measured in how one treats a vulnerable 15-year-old girl at a party and in how one treats all those involved in that alleged incident from the early 80s that has stalled the Supreme Court nomination process. These words of Jesus measure greatness not in one's shrewd calculation of how their political party might benefit from all this on election day, but his words measure greatness in the degree of compassion shown now to the countless women who've been re-traumatized this week, who've had nightmares from the past triggered and called up like haunting ghosts, and who are made to remember again how they, like those women at the empty tomb in the Gospel of Luke, were not believed by the people who mattered at the time. If you're a Twitter user, I would encourage you to scroll through some of the thousands of stories shared this week by women and men reliving the past with the hashtag, why I didn't report. I was scrolling through those stories on Friday. After a minute or so, another hundred stories appeared. I refreshed the page and scrolled some more. Another several hundred stories appeared. I waited a few hours and over a thousand more appeared when I refreshed the page. One person tweeted yesterday, every single person posting hashtag why I didn't report is reliving their trauma this week to try and teach folks to extend long overdue empathy. The folks posting are only a drop in the bucket. Journalist Carolyn Chen tweeted these statistics. Out of a thousand sexual assaults, only about 300 are reported. Only 57 of those will lead to arrest and just seven of them will result in a felony conviction. The Jesus who once embraced a little child and taught about how to measure greatness is the same Jesus who the Gospels say practiced what he preached when he sat beside a woman at a well and just talked with her when no one else would, or when he stood between a condemned woman and her hypocritical accusers and said, let the one without sin cast the first stone at her, or when he showed compassion to a woman the Gospels call a woman of the city, a euphemism for prostitute, while those sitting nearby were ready to dismiss and judge her. Or the time he invited himself over to the tax collector Zacchaeus' house when everyone else shunned the man. Or when he touched a leper. Or when he forgave those who crucified him. Or when he stopped mansplaining to a Syrophoenician woman and simply empathized with her situation. Whoever welcomes one such person in my name welcomes me, he taught. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. This week, Caitlin Flanagan published a piece in The Atlantic that recounts her story from the past, but with the twist of redemption. Let me close by sharing a portion of that story, which begins with a letter. Dear Caitlin, an inscription in my 12th grade yearbook begins. I'm really very sorry that our friendship plummeted straight downhill after the first few months of school. Really, the blame rests totally on my shoulders. To tell you the truth, I've wanted to say this all year. I know you'll succeed because you're very smart. I regard you with the utmost respect. Take care. Love, always. He was headed to a prestigious college, writes Flanagan. I was headed to a small, obscure liberal arts college, which was a tremendous achievement, not just because I was a terrible student, but also because I had nearly killed myself as a response to what he apologized for in my yearbook. It was an attempted date rape. I had grown up in Berkeley, she continues, but just before my senior year of high school, my father took a job on Long Island. I desperately missed my friends. Although I only found out years later my father was confiscating all of their letters to me, he thought they were a bad influence and that I should make a clean break. I felt completely alone. I couldn't figure out how to make friends. But then a good-looking senior, who later wrote that letter, offered to drive me home one day. 
I was so excited. I saw the solution to all of my problems, my sadness, my loneliness, my inability to figure out how to go to the parties the other kids were always talking about in the hallways. I told no one after the incident. In my mind, it was an example of how undesirable I was. My depression quickly escalated after that. But then, at the beginning of the second semester, a different boy asked me out. Another drive home. You'd think I would have learned. But from the minute we got in the car, I knew this was different. Flanagan goes on to describe their conversation, his kindness to her, how they eventually started dating, and how the boy who'd written the letter of apology met her two years later with tears in his eyes and apologized again. If you get a chance, take some time to read all of Caitlin Flanagan's piece in The Atlantic, especially if you formed opinions in the Kavanaugh hearings. But this little snippet I've shared with you is just one example, I think, of how powerful, how eternal is that teaching of Jesus, the teaching that greatness is measured in kindness, kindness and empathy and compassion. Such greatness is a form of welcome, an opening of arms that embraces not only the people around us, but the Christ in those people. And not just the Christ in those people, but the God who embraces us all. Amen.